in case you didn't know, Ian is actually the secret identity of, uh, Richard, have you seen the Avengers movies? Any of the recent ones? Okay, uh, Google Hawkeye Avengers when you're not on conference Wi-Fi, and that is, uh, Ian is the secret identity. Uh, he swooped in and was a superhero for Emily and I last night. So uh, can we give him a round of applause? He was just amazing. And all the near formers, they've been amazing. Um, if you ever get invited to speak at a near form conference, go, because they treat you amazingly and they're super great. So that said, code robots and people. Um, so we came up with our own hashtag. Nerd curf learned in like, um, like uh, the, the meme, uh, er my gerd gersperms. It's nerd curf learned in. Um, and I have a joke to start. Um, what do hippies use with their cell phones? Tree G instead of 3G. Anyway, I told you that we were right. That worked way better than tree DMA. Um, so about me. Like you had said, I'm from Austin. I had to get y'all laughing or y'all would fall asleep during my talk. I am a developer evangelist for Auth0. Um, I really like to talk about OpenID Connect, and I've read the entire OAuth 1 and 2 specifications from cover to cover, so you don't have to. Um, and uh, I also like robots, kind of obviously. Baseball, um, I was watching it at 3 this morning over VPN. Uh, woodworking, sewing, and a bunch of other things. And my cats are adorable. Um, I, I can't help but shoehorn my cats into my talk. Uh, the one on the top is Ace, and the one on the bottom is Arya, uh, as in Game of Thrones' Arya Stark. She's totally living up to her name. And they're so seriously cute that this is, this is why they gave me a Wi-Fi hotspot, is so I could show you this video. Of, of my cats, which I apparently have to like, exit the window to do, but I'm gonna do it because it's important. Because it's cats and it's morning and I'm waking y'all up. There we go. Where's Chrome? There's no internet. What? Oi. Fine. Um, let's do that. Anyway, I'll show you my cat video at the end because, you know, I've got 30 minutes up here. Um, I don't know why this is suddenly upside down. This was very much not upside down last night when I, oh, it's, it's right side up on the street up there. On my screen, it's upside down. So uh, my dad uh, is an electrical engineer. My father um, kind of got me into robotics, and um, uh, he, due to my efforts, is now back into robotics, and he sent me this video two, two days ago. So he's like, hey, these NeoPixel things and these RGB LEDs, they're not half bad. And like, I had no idea. <laughs> so. About my outfit, um, so the node sash, which I'm wearing across my uh, belt, is uh, you can tweet at it and it will add colors to the belt. Um, you tweet at the hashtag node sash and it will add the color to the belt. Uh, you have to add the tag nerd curve learn learn with it. Um, any CSS parsable colors, so RGB, hex, um, any of those, they'll all work. So my belts will probably change colors like a million times over the course of this talk, which is fine. That's kind of the point. Anyway. So why do we code? Um, and, and the reason I ask this is because if you want to bake an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. And if you get that joke, you're smart and awesome. Not that you're not smart if you don't get it, but you are smart if you get that joke too. But really, why do we code? We code to work, we code to learn, and we code for fun. I'm going to leave for work uh, as its own subject. We all know why we code for work, because we get paid. We're going to look into a little bit more of why we code to learn and why we code for fun. When we're coding to learn, a lot of the times we are either begrudgingly or otherwise looking at code and reverse engineering it, trying to figure out how it works. If someone was nice enough to leave us comments, even better. But most of the time, let's face it, we all forget to leave comments from time to time. So we're reverse engineering something without comments. And then writing a hello world and a new technology are going a little deeper. But coding for fun is an entirely um, different arena. Uh, it's, we're coding for the sake of building things, things that make us happy, uh, things that may never impress anyone or may never even be shown to anyone. Um, I, I know at least a couple people that have code diaries where they make things uh, that just belong strictly to them. Um, we do it to push our own boundaries, and we do it to push the boundaries of the world around us. I didn't have a great time in school. Um, I was bullied a lot in high school, and I couldn't control a lot of my outside world. But when I got home to my computer and I booted up RPG Maker and I could write little bits of code and make little 2D sprites walk across the screen, I had control of that. That was my world that I could control. And I think that's a lot of why we code for fun, is, is it gives us that ability to feel like we have control over a little bit of our universe, and especially at a time so tumultuous where many of us feel like we do not have control over a lot of the external factors that surround us. 
a means of escapism, if you will. The interrelation, I feel, is a lot of us, especially in rooms like this, ones who go to conferences and reach out to speak, we code for work so it keeps us paid so we can build our communities for fun. And I believe this is true because otherwise open source software as we know it would not exist. If it weren't at least a little fun, we wouldn't do it. We would just code for work, go home, and that's it. Maybe there'd be a little open source because companies, you know, they would want to open source their work. But I don't think this room would be full of people if we didn't also code for fun. Um, so most of this coding for fun comes in the form of side projects, which contain no real business value. But is that really true? Do side projects really contain no business value? I find no, they do. Uh, because the health and happiness of your employees is just as important as the product you are creating. If you have burned out, tired employees, um, you're not going to get as good of a product out of them. Also, side projects bring new people into the code industry. Um, I've personally had at least two different kids start robotics because they saw my skirt while I was wandering around in downtown Austin, Texas. We bring people in with our side projects. We bring new people into the industry, especially in an industry that in 2020 will have two jobs for every qualified engineer, which qualified is kind of a loaded word, but you get my point. It's not like we don't have the jobs for the people that we want to pull in. And then we encourage curiosity with these side projects. And a lot of the things that we use today are a product of that curiosity, a product of that, hey, can I actually do that with code? Oh, look, I can. Uh, there's a quote from Sagan that really applies here. And yet our species is young and curious and brave and shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it, explorations that are exhilarating to consider. They remind us that humans have evolved to wonder, that understanding is a joy, that knowledge is a prerequisite to survival. I believe our future depends on how well we know this cosmos in which we float, like a mode of dust in the morning sky. If you've never read Sagan, that's pretty much all like this, very poetic and very awesome, so you should definitely read it. I think our very species needs these side projects. And by species, I mean human and developer. We need these projects because, uh, be, be they code or otherwise, to continue to thrive. Those explorations required skepticism and imagination both. Imagination will often carry us to worlds that were never were. But without it, we go nowhere. Skepticism enables us to distinguish fancy from fact to test our speculation. The cosmos is rich beyond me measure in elegant facts, in exquisite interrelationships, in the subtle machinery of awe. When you think about your first time writing code, be it on a, a, an Apple II or whatever you want to brag about your first coding experience was. For me, it was a, a Game Shark. I wrote Game Shark codes when I was eight. Um, when you find that you have the ability to manipulate an entire cosmos, even though that cosmos is essentially a, a video game or a, a computer game or a web browser, I, I don't remember if you remember that rush, but I try to remember it every time I create something new. There's a rush of excitement when we realize that we have a small bit of control over such a powerful system. But why code? Why is code becoming such a popular way to express ourselves, to uh, you know, create these side projects and create this escapism? I believe it's mostly because code allows us to begin from almost nothing. We can take a small, cheap computer and build an apple pie or an entire cosmos from scratch. One could even say you can use a raspberry pi to create an apple pie. <laughs> when talking about um, the scientific breakthroughs of um, VCE, Sagan says, Aristophanes' only tools were sticks, eyes, feet, and brains, plus a taste for experiment. With them, he deduced the circumference of the Earth with an error of only a few percent, a remarkable achievement for 2,200 years ago. He was the first person to accurately measure the size of a planet with a few sticks, some brains, and a want to know more. And I believe that's why code is becoming such a popular way um, to express ourselves, is because we can, with almost nothing, hardware, software-wise, and with the av availability of knowledge, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, we can build cosmoses of our own. Um, when I say side projects of code or otherwise, um, I'm kind of making an attack on tropes. I'm sick of the developer trope, especially as a non-binary non person who likes baseball. Um, I, for, for the record, if everybody in this room could stop going, ugh, sports ball. Every time you hear someone is a developer and into sports, that'd be great. We'd make the world just a little bit better because we're allowed to have hobbies outside code. You know, like raise your hand if you have a hobby outside code. 
Yeah? See, we're all admitting it. We're all still developers, right? No one, no one had their developer card taken away, right? OK, cool. You can have other hobbies, including sports. Now, if you're not interested in sports, you can admit that. Just don't like you roll your eyes and go, ugh, sports ball. Like, just don't. Let's just, let's just stop that. Um, anyway, robotics. Robotics is quickly becoming another way to express ourselves um, in the physical world because it's one thing to change something in a video game. It's one thing to change something in a web browser. It's an entirely different thing to show up on a stage wearing a bunch of lights and uh, have someone in the audience think, I can do that. I can make that. I can, I can also participate in this. We're moving in the same direction with robotics as we are with code. Cheaper boards, less to start, more to gain. Uh, for instance, I have only been doing robotics for about almost three years now. Uh, I have now published a chapter in a book and a book in itself on the subject. Um, I don't have any e-degree or any real formal training in robotics, but I've, I've you know, managed to get myself started. And you can too. Uh, Johnny5, for instance, has over 35 platforms that it now supports. So if you have an old Arduino board um, in a closet somewhere, you can probably use Johnny5 with it. Uh, we also have lots of other platforms that are coming out by the day, things like the Tessel, the Kinoma, the Esperino. Um, the Esperino was actually created in the UK by a man named Gordon Williams. So I made sure to mention that because, you know, Esperino, UK, awesome. We're doing really cool things with NodeBots, and you can check YouTube out for a lot of them. I'm, in fact, uh, one, uh, it feels like I'm bragging when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So uh, if you look at Donovan Buck's work, he's doing a lot of work with hexapods in Johnny5, and it's really cool. Uh, he actually learned NodeBots from a NodeBots Austin event that I ran. So like the first NodeBots day, Austin, he showed up. And in two years, he went from that to hexapods that walk across the stage and react to a leap motion controller. And it's like the coolest stuff ever. The reason I didn't link to it on YouTube is because while I am here to talk about NodeBots and code, more important than code and more important than robots is the people that create that code and the robots that these people create. No, the people that create the robots. Sorry. <laughs> Can you tell I didn't get a ton of sleep? But unfortunately, the subject of people has me swinging between wildly optimistic and extremely cynical. Because while I see encouraging signs from the community every day, I also see discouraging signs from the community every day. So when I talk about cynicism, I make a metaphor at the library at, at Alexandria. The library at Alexandria was a library in 300 BCE. And uh, it's best summed up, again, by Sagan. For centuries, they supported research and maintained the library in a working environment for the best minds of the age. It contained 10 large research halls, each devoted to a separate subject. Fountains and colonnades, botanical gardens, a zoo, dissecting rooms, an observatory, and a great dining hall where, at leisure, we, was conducted the critical discussion of ideas. The heart of the library was, was its collection of books. The organizers combed all the cultures and languages of the world. They sent agents abroad to buy up libraries. Commercial ships docking in Alexandria were searched by the police, not for contraband, but for books. The scrolls were confiscated, <laughs> copied, and returned to their owners in proper state. Accurate numbers are difficult to estimate, but it seems probable that the library contained half a million volumes, each a handwritten papyrus scroll. Today we have the internet. Today we have GitHub. Today we measure things not in half of millions of books, but half of millions of stars on GitHub and in the universe. <laughs> the problem is we have the Library of Alexandria. We have this open source movement. But I feel we're lacking in our passion to fill it because we're excluding others. And we allow those who patronize their communities to arbitrarily filter people out and scare other people out of our communities. We allow people into the library who then drive others out. And so we're missing lots of pieces of information that could be collected if we were allowed to more people in. The fate of the Alexandrian library is really sad. What happened to all those books? The classical civilization that created them disintegrated, and the library itself was deliberately destroyed. Only a small fraction of its work survived, along with a few pathetic scattered fragments. And how tantalizing those bits and pieces are. We know, for example, that there was on the library shelves a book by the astronomer Aristarchus of Samos, who argued that the Earth is one of the planets which, like them, orbits the sun, and that the stars are enormously far away. Each of these conclusions is entirely correct, but we had to wait nearly 2,000 years for their rediscovery. If we multiply by 100,000 our sense of loss for this work of Aristarchus, we begin to appreciate the grandeur of the achievement that classical civilization and the tragedy of its destruction. I, I wish I were hyperbolizing, but we are on the brink of destroying ourselves as a community by creating the exclusion of others, be it 
explicit or accidental, be it compulsory or be it on, explicit, on purpose. We are actively excluding members of, of our community and we threaten to destroy ourselves. Um, codes of conduct and the metaphor of the library. I'm very glad they took the time to read the code of conduct this morning as I am an ardent fan of code of conduct. In fact, I do not speak at events that do not have a code of conduct. Um, and if you're sitting out there thinking, well, I don't need a code of conduct, guess what? It's not for you. We create rules in our communities to allow people in, not keep people out. We all make mistakes, but the code of conduct sorts us out. I hear oftentimes uh, arguments against the code of, code of conduct say, oh, well, you're going to kick someone out for saying something wrong the first time. I have never seen a code of conduct application that way. I've seen a code of conduct application of, oh, we need to resolve this matter. So if you're from the UK, it's much like, it seems much like the police here. They don't want to arrest anybody. They just want to get things settled, right? They want to talk everything out and get it all settled and no one goes to jail. That's pretty much the same with the code of conduct. We're not, try, we're not, we're not on a hunt to find a person that says something wrong and kick them out. We're merely trying to create a safe space for the people who aren't here, but we want them to be here. And we do need these rules because we do not all act like adults. The next time I hear, but we all act like adults, no, no, we do not. And even when we do, we really don't. The allegory between ancient science and today's communities. The problem was then was that the rules prevented the study and spread of ideas. Nepotism became the rule of science. The sons of scientists were scientists, not the daughters or the cousins or the neighbors or anyone interested in science. Uh, the Dark Ages were brought about by the overtaking of the scientific community by a group that believed that um, only if you were born into a scientific family should you be allowed to study science. We're getting really close to the exact opposite. Today, the lack of a rule system allows the oppression created by that former system to prevent the study and spread of ideas. Let's face it, the tech community is awfully monochromatic, not just from a representation of race, but from a representation of gender. We need to become more diverse and less monochromatic. And we need to overcome the mistakes of our ancestors and that we need to remove the nepotism and the oppression from studying of the sciences, including computer science, which would include programming. But what makes me optimistic about people is the idea of Ionia. Ionia was the center of scientific, the scientific community and is considered the birthplace of the scientific method. With many different islands, there was a variety of political systems. No single concentration of power could enforce social and intellectual conformity in all the islands. Free inquiry became possible. The promotion of superstition was not considered a political necessity. Unlike many other cultures, the Ionians were at a crossroad of civilizations, not at one of the centers. In Ionia, the Phoenician alphabet was first trend adapted to Greek usage and widespread literacy became possible. Writing was no longer a monopoly of the priests and the scribes. The thoughts of many were available for its consideration and debate. It was in the Eastern Mediterranean that African, Asian, and European civilizations, including the great cultures of Egypt and Mesopotamia, met and cross-fertilized in a vigorous and heady confrontation of prejudices, languages, ideas, and gods. We exist in that world today. Because you can log on and there are at least 50 free tutorials for just about anything you can think of, of varying quality. We have the internet in many places and we're actively striving to get internet to the places you still can't get it. We have access to this information on a scale that's unprecedented when Carl Sagan wrote this work in the 1970s. He um, talks about it a little bit in his last work, which is in the 1990s, and he basically foresaw this. He said, the, I see the beginnings of the internet, and I see it as the next library of Alexandria. I see it as the next place you can go to, and hopefully humankind will not destroy it. He was talking about the use of the atomic bomb, but there are other ways humans can destroy the uh, library of Alexandria. Um, with this comes a note on destroying your idols. So I don't mean like physically go out. I'm obviously not promoting the assault of anyone. Um, that would be bad. But what I'm talking about is destroying the idea that there are people in this community who through their contributions have outweighed their behavior. What do you do when you're faced with several different gods claiming the same territory? The Babylonian Marduk and the Greek Zeus were each considered master of the sky and king of the gods. You might decide that Marduk and Zeus were really the same. You might also decide, since they had quite different attributes, that one of them was merely invented by the priests. But if one, why not both? 
And so it was that the great idea arose, the realization that there might be a way to know the world without the God hypothesis, that there might be principles, forces, and laws of nature through which the world could be understood without attributing the fall of every sparrow to the direct intervention of Zeus. I believe this to be true of the tech community. Every one of us is capable of, capable of understanding the structure of a program on our own. We do not need to pick a favorite and stick with it forever. If you like promises, that's great. Know why you like promises. That'll help. But don't insult someone for using callbacks. I actually really like that Kean added technological choices to the code of conduct. I have been named and shamed for, using, uh, for being a PHP developer in a past life. And I'm really sick of PHP developer jokes. I get it. We use JavaScript. But they use PHP, and it works just fine for them. So let's knock it off. We are, at our best, a global version of Ionia. Information is freely available, and besides the pessimism of how we treat each other, we are getting code and robotics into the hands of more people than ever. With things like the Raspberry Pi Zero and initiatives uh, like Black Girls Code in the US and Node Girls across the world, we are getting more and more code and robotics into the hands of people who are underrepresented in the technical industry. Now, we just need to fix the cesspool that we throw them into once we've gotten it into their hands. We must work much harder to prevent destruction than we currently do to spread information. Not that we should let work less hard on, spread, on spreading information. We, could, we should continue to do that. But we should also, each of us, take a stand against the mistreatment of others and create a better community for ourselves and for the programmers to come. There are a few empty seats in this auditorium. Wouldn't it be great if we could add some people that don't look like us into those seats or don't think like us? Studies have started to show in the last two years that diversity sells, diversity solves more problems, and diversity creates happier workers. With all of that information, we have yet to truly create a diverse tech society. And that's, again, where I swing back to pessimism, from optimism, back to cynicism, back to optimism. I have an ultimatum that I've been stating recently, and I'm going to state it again, and I still stand by this ultimatum. We do not need horrible people that happen to write good code in our communities. If we support everyone and become the Ionia presiding over Alexandria, good code will follow. We can get rid of all the bad actors, the repetitive, unrepentant bad actors in our community. And we will not fail. Because by supporting anyone who wants to learn to code, I would bet my life savings that we would have, if not as good, better code in our communities than we currently do with the toxic tech environment that still surrounds us. My spark of hope is the idea of Johannes Kepler. He created the laws of planetary motion and begun to discover the fundamental underpinnings of gravity. He thought the planets were held together by magnetism. It wasn't later until Isaac Newton that gravity was uh, formulated as a concept, and they are different. But he did accurately understand how the planets rotate around the sun in elliptical orbits and how the forces created, uh, how the forces created those elliptical orbits. He was also a light of sharing knowledge as nepotism and fear began to destroy the scientific process. Kepler was jailed at one point in his lifetime for teaching slaves to read. There were slaves in Ionian society, much like there was in many um, pre-modern societies. And Kepler was at one point imprisoned for about a week for trying to teach a slave to read. One of his most, I think, um, palpable quotes is by changing our perspective, we can figure out how worlds work. As long as the multitude does not err, I want to be on the side of the many. Therefore, I take great pains to explain to as many people as possible. On another occasion, he wrote in a letter, do not sentence me completely to the treadmill of mathematical calculation. Leave me time for philosophical speculations, my soul delight. In the context of this quote, philosophical speculations meant teaching. Teaching was considered a philosophical pursuit instead of a mathematical pursuit. So Kepler was saying, give me time to teach, not just time to research. You too can be a Kepler of the tech society. Um, this is a very common phrase by the US TSA, and it's used to scare people, but I'd like to repurpose it for something better. If you see something, say something. If you see a racist joke and no one of that race is in the room, speak up or no one of that particular gender identity or expression is in the room. Speak up. Not cool, man. Works way better than you think it would. Well, not cool person. Not cool whoever. <laughs> Sorry, it's 
I mean, that kind of shows my own prejudices, but usually I have to say not cool, dude, or, but not cool. Just works, you know? And it doesn't have to be against you in order for you to speak up. In fact, that makes it even easier. I had a male friend recently talk to me, and he was talking about, well, how can I help? How can I make things better? And I go, okay, so you remember how two weeks ago someone made a joke about women belonging in the kitchen and no one spoke up? And he was like, yeah. And I go, yeah, I didn't speak up because I was under a little bit of pressure to not speak up and not create a stir. However, the repercussions on you as a male would have been lower. Speak up. Say something. The repercussions you will face will be at worst teasing. But I promise you, you are much, much less likely to be assaulted for calling out a transphobic insult than a trans person themselves. Unless you're trans, and then, yeah, you face that same fate, unfortunately. I have a final thought. It's a very long thought, but a final thought. I'm not going to explain this quote because it tends to mean something different to every single person. I am reluctantly a self-confessed carbon chauvinist. Carbon is abundant in the cosmos. It makes marvelously complex molecules that are good for life. I am also a water chauvinist. Water makes an ideal solvent system for organic chemistry to work in and stays liquid over a wide range of temperatures. But sometimes I wonder, could my fondness for materials have something to do with the fact that I am chiefly made of them? Are we carbon and water based because those materials were abundant on Earth at the time of the origin of life? Could life elsewhere, on Mars say, be built of different stuff? I am a collection of water, calcium, and organic molecules called Carl Sagan. You are a collection of almost identical molecules with a different collective label. But is that all? Is there nothing in here but molecules? Some people find this idea somehow demeaning to human dignity. For myself, I find it elevating that our universe permits the evolution of molecular machines as intricate and subtle as we. But the essence of life is not so much the atoms and simple molecules that make us up as the way we are put together. Every now and then, we read that the chemicals which constitute the human body cost 97 cents or $10 or some such figure. It is a little depressing to find our bodies valued so little. However, these estimates are for human beings reduced to our simplest possible component. We are made mostly of water, which costs almost nothing. The carbon is costed in the form of coal. The calcium in our bones is chalk. The nitrogen in our protein is air, also cheap. The iron in our blood is rusty nails. If we did not know better, we might be tempted to take all the atoms that make us up, mix them together in a big container, and stir. We can do this as much as we want. But in the end, all we have is a tedious mixture of atoms. How could we have expected anything else? Harold Morowitz has calculated what it would cost to put together the correct molecular constituents that make up a human being by buying the molecules from chemical supply houses. The answer, this being written in 1978, turns out to be $10 million, which should make us all feel a little better. But even then, we could not mix those chemicals together and have a human being emerge from the jar. That is far beyond our capability and probably will be so for a very long period of time. Thank you for listening. Um, hopefully you've learned something and hopefully you'll treat the people around you just a little bit better. Uh, I am Cassandra Perch. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub as NodeBotanist. And um, at the bottom there is my email address. Cass, K-A-S, at auth0.com will also redirect to me. Thank you very much for listening, and as Carl Sagan's politely pointing out, you're all awesome. <laughs>